We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts. So we'll be looking at the last few verses of chapter 21 in just a few minutes, and then we'll be moving into the first 16 verses of chapter 22. So I hope you can get your Bibles ready and join me in the book of Acts in just a few moments. And I am joined in my study this, uh, this afternoon by our beagle. She is in here at my feet. And so I just want to let you know right now, if you, uh, if you hear excessive scratching or barking, uh, that is not me. That is, that is her. I'm going to blame that on her. We've already had our excitement for the day. The FedEx guy came bringing uh, four new toners for the church copy machine a few minutes ago. So thankfully we got that out of the way. Uh, but if somebody else stops by, I just want to, want to let you know it is on. So uh, she's a little bit excitable and unstable, and uh, she's a good puppy down there. Anyway, I just want to let you know that. But I hope to see you for worship this Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And I hope all of us can be present for the Bible class at 10. We're continuing to look at the exploits of King David. The exploits of King David. This past Sunday, we had, I think, one of the best Bible classes I've ever been in. We studied the Word of God. A good number participated in class. There were good comments, good questions. We had some practical lessons. And uh, that's what a Bible class is all about. So I hope you can join us this coming Sunday at 10. Uh, for class and then for our members please use the sign up genius account if you can to sign up for one of the two worship services either 9 or 11 and remember guests are always welcome so you don't need to sign up if you're just visiting with us we just want to see you so we uh, hope you can be there at either 9 or 11 and also for class in between uh, tonight we're getting back to our study of the book of acts as i said the acts of the apostles or more accurately some of the acts of some of the apostles so uh, mainly peter in the beginning then paul at the end of the book and the book was written by Luke, the beloved physician, to a man named Theophilus, just kind of giving him a history of the early church. By way of very brief review, just want to go through this in case you're joining us for the first time tonight. We've been looking at the ABCs of Acts as a way of remembering what's in each chapter. So we had the ascension, then the beginning of the church, the man who was uh, carried and cured in chapter 3, determined disciples in chapter 4, then the empty jail. First deacons with the question mark in chapter 6. In chapter 7, we had Stephen, the great hero, and I'm going to be referring to Stephen just a little bit tonight. In Acts 8, we had the Ethiopian officer asking, how can I, how can I understand unless someone guides me? In chapter 9, I am Jesus. We'll also be referring back to this tonight in just a few moments, if the Lord wills. In chapter 10, we had the journey to Joppa. In chapter 11, the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, Peter is liberated again. In chapter 13, missionaries sent out. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they are not gods but men. In chapter 15, old law is not binding. In chapter 16, the Philippian jailer converted, of course, along with uh, Lydia there. In chapter 17, questions answered in Athens with Paul preaching on the Areopagus. In chapter 18, we had reasoning with a preacher. So we had Priscilla and Aquila pulling Apollos aside to explain to him the way of God more accurately. In chapter 19, saving our religious friends. So we had Paul uh, questioning and then baptizing or rebaptizing, as we might put it. Uh, those 12 men in Ephesus who had been baptized improperly the first time. In Acts 20, we had Troas on the Lord's Day, followed by Paul's message to the elders from Ephesus on the beach at Miletus. And of course, we're in the middle of a two-part sermon series on Sunday uh, right now, based on Acts 20, verses 32 through 35. So that's relevant to uh, where we are on Sunday right now. In Acts 21, Paul returns from his third missionary journey. And as he moves around Jerusalem, he is accompanied by a Gentile. I think his name was Trophimus. And uh, some of the Jews then accuse Paul of bringing multiple Gentiles into the temple itself. And a false accusation. They are uh, making this uh, worse than it is. It didn't even happen at all. Uh, but they're making it sound really bad. And so that leads to the uproar in Jerusalem. So a riot takes place. Uh, people are shouting. They're probably getting ready just to tear Paul limb from limb. Uh, they are incredibly angry. They're mad at Paul until the Roman soldiers step in. So we'll finish off the last few verses of chapter 21 tonight, and then we'll move into chapter 22, which is summarized with the words, valuable citizenship. So valuable citizenship in chapter 22. Uh, we won't get to his citizenship being valuable until next week. So we're not there quite yet, but uh, that'll be coming up later in this chapter. So I've just gone ahead 
And I put that on the screen there so we can have that there. So chapter 22, Valuable Citizenship. Uh, by way of very brief review, this ride is taking place in the temple courtyard. So that would be on that paved area in the lower left-hand corner of the model of the temple on the picture there on your screen. Uh, last week, we learned that the Romans actually built a fortress connected to the temple in Jerusalem. King Herod kind of funded the temple, funded the restoration of it. But as a condition, he basically said, I'm going to add this little fortress over here. And so this is a scale model of the temple in Jerusalem. So in the lower left-hand corner, there's the courtyard of the temple. And then attached to it, we have these four huge guard towers. I hope you can see that. Uh, right in the middle of the screen there. And so those towers are connected around this fortress. And it was absolutely huge. I think those guard towers were about 60 feet tall. So like a six-story building, each one of those there. So they used this fortress as barracks. And it was kind of a headquarters for the Roman military there in Jerusalem. Uh, it was very strategically placed. We talked about this last week. So within seconds... Uh, they could absolutely flood the temple area with hundreds of soldiers. And so in case of any unrest, uh, they could take care of it almost immediately. And that's basically what happens here. So Paul is in the temple courtyard area. The crowd goes wild based on these rumors of Paul having brought a Gentile or multiple Gentiles into the temple. And so they are incredibly upset. They're about to rip him limb from limb. The commander gets word of this. He immediately sends in these troops. They come save the day. Uh, as the commander is dragging Paul up the stairs and away from the crowds, I'm thinking uh, mosh pit style, so Paul kind of body surfing, uh, kind of dragging him out of there, and the crowds are shouting, away with him, away with him. So it's almost like the crowds with Jesus, crucify him. So they weren't thinking straight, but this mob mentality takes over. Bad things happen uh, when mobs riot. We know this. And so in this moment, this heated moment, Paul speaks to the commander. So he turns to this man who is in the process of rescuing him from this mob. And this is where we pick up tonight. So Paul is on these stairs somewhere in between the temple courtyard and the fortress of Antonia there in the corner. So he's right there. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 21. Verses 37 through 41. Acts 21, 37 through 41. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia a citizen of no insignificant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, saying. Okay, up in verse 37, as Paul is being dragged or almost carried or escorted from the riot and up into the safety of the barracks, he speaks to the commander. So very respectfully, he's not demanding, but he's questioning, may I say something to you? So he doesn't just say it, but he asks permission to say it. So he's got that little buffer in there. And at this point, the commander seems to be somewhat surprised that Paul knows Greek, the Greek language. And this is where we find that the commander has assumed something incorrectly about Paul. So just as the Jewish people assume something incorrectly, uh, so also the commander as well. But they're on different pages completely here. Two different assumptions are being made. Up to this point, the commander was apparently assuming that Paul was some kind of Egyptian assassin. And I think this is where we realize that any Roman commander in Jerusalem is probably almost constantly on the lookout for trouble. Jerusalem is something of a crossroads of the world back then, right in between Egypt and the rest of Africa to the south, and then the rest of the world to the north, to the east and also to the west. So with the uh, Fertile Crescent down there, I mean, this is, everything comes through Jerusalem. A lot of travel takes place through there. We don't have too much information here. But there was apparently a group known as the Assassins. They were led by an Egyptian. They were made up of 4,000 men who holed up out there in the wilderness. And with a name like Assassins, they are obviously up to no good, especially if you're someone worth assassinating. 
which the Roman commander probably was. Uh, they had a tradition of taking these little short daggers with them, and they would just go out into crowds, and they would stab people. So they would uh, get those who were most important in their view, and they would just kill them right there in public. And for some reason, the commander assumes Paul is maybe the ringleader. So we've got him. He's right here. He's in my custody. And yet when Paul speaks up in Greek, the commander is somewhat surprised, isn't he? So there, there seems to be a little bit of shock here. This, this must not be the guy that we've been looking for. So now I have no idea who I'm looking at here. I, I don't know what's going on. So Paul then explains, no, that he is a Jew. He is of Tarsus in Cilicia. He is a citizen of uh, no insignificant city. So kind of the negative going on there, but uh, this is an important city. So uh, Paul is explaining he's not an assassin. He's not some guy from out in the middle of nowhere. He's definitely not from Egypt, but he is a citizen of Cilicia. Uh, if we had a map, we, I could point out Cilicia is right at the far northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. So it was a, a key city for trade and for commerce just a few miles inland. Uh, today, it would be like saying that you were from New York or Seattle. So it's, it's a city that uh, everybody would have recognized. So uh, Paul is not some country bumpkin by any means. He's not out there to cause trouble. He's not intending harm to this commander or anybody else. But he is an actual citizen of a major Roman city. And uh, so valuable citizenship, it's, it's kind of leading into this. We're not quite to that point yet. But I think the commander probably should have paid attention to this. And we'll see that a little bit later, but he doesn't. And uh, we'll be getting back to that hopefully next week. Uh, for now, Paul begs the commander for permission to speak to the people. And this is amazing to me, isn't it? I mean, we think about the scene here. He's there on the uh, pavement area we looked at on the picture. He's being pulled up away from the crowds. They're screaming away with him, away with him. And yet Paul wants to talk to these people who are trying to kill him. And uh, Paul then, he motions with his hand. And I guess first I should say I'm kind of surprised that the commander would allow this. Uh, I'm thinking of if the police arrest somebody leading a riot or the focus of the riot, and if that guy says, hey, can I talk to the crowds? Um, I'm thinking today the answer most likely would be no. We're getting you out of here. We're going to sort this out in private, and then we'll go from there. And so Paul establishes some kind of relationship with this commander. So Paul emotions is with uh, motions with his hand. The crowd goes quiet, and then he speaks. And he switches from the Greek that he used to speak to the commander, and he switches to the Hebrew language. And I think that just reminds us that Paul knows his audience, doesn't he? He knows who he's talking to. So he's in the temple. Uh, Paul was definitely multilingual, wasn't he? So he's very educated, and he uses his education to communicate. And this is what happens next. Uh, so we'll continue with Paul's speech then in Acts 22, verses 1 through 5. So we're moving right over into chapter 22. So he motions with his hand, they go quiet, and starting in Acts 22, verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren, and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. We noticed in verse 1 that Paul addresses these people as brethren and fathers. And I think we noticed there Paul is respectful. So these men had just tried to tear him to pieces. They were calling for his death, away with him, and so on. And here Paul is now addressing them as brothers and fathers. So these are his peers, but there are also some in the crowd who are apparently perhaps older than Paul. So his fathers, the older men of the group there, and he's addressing them with the utmost of respect. It would have been very easy for Paul uh, to really come down hard on these people. Who do you think you are doing this in God's house? I mean, he could have said stuff like that. 
uh, but that's not the direction he takes this. So he's very dip diplomatic. He's very respectful. He doesn't um, insult the audience. I think normally that's kind of an important thing for someone speaking in public to remember. But he's very diplomatic, very respectful in his words. I would also point out that this is almost exactly the way Stephen spoke to the crowd back in Acts chapter 7. If you want to look back at that, that's Acts 7, the first few verses there. But Stephen started his uh, speech there by saying, Hear me, brethren and fathers. And Paul says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. So to me, it certainly seems as if Paul might be remembering Stephen on this occasion. He has the great honor of perhaps following here in Stephen's footsteps. And I'm thinking he's probably aware, especially based on the prophecy that he's heard leading up to this, that, uh, that his case could end very similar to the way Stephen's ended. But uh, nevertheless, he is diplomatic and respectful. In the last half of verse 1, he describes this as his defense. So Paul is defending himself. This is an argument based on reason. The word he uses here is the basis for our English word apologetics. So not an apology in the I'm sorry sense of that word, but a reasoned defense. So he's going to use some logic. He's going to use words and history, and he's going to reason with them. It's at this point that they realize he is speaking in the Hebrew dialect. So as soon as he gets that first sentence out, um, they quiet down even more. So Paul is one of them. He's not an outsider coming in to cause trouble, but Paul looks like them. He's probably dressed like them. He sounds like them. He's got their accent. He's speaking their language. And so he has their full attention. Notice he starts by introducing himself as a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia but brought up in this city. So he was born in Cilicia, but he was raised in Jerusalem. So I'm not an outsider. I'm one of you. I, I am like you. And in Jerusalem, he is educated under Gamaliel strictly according to the law of our fathers. Gamaliel was apparently a well-known rabbi. He was a Pharisee. We know this from other passages. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, we see the name Gamaliel several times in the Old Testament. It's not the same guy. He's mentioned way back, you know, like 1,400 years ago in Numbers or whatever. Uh, but it was a name that was used back then, and it was apparently passed down through the years, probably in families. Um, so we've got it a few times in the Old Testament. The name pops up again in Acts 5. Uh, and what's in Acts 5? Well, A, B, C, D, E, so empty jail. So it's in the empty jail chapter. The apostles are put in jail for preaching. Uh, God arranges for them to be let out, and when they're brought before the council again, you may remember it is Gamaliel who speaks up on that occasion. What do we do? We've put these men in jail, and they're out, and there's no explanation. So how do we handle this? What in the world is going on here? But this goes back to Acts 5, 33 through 39, and Gamaliel, uh, he gives, I would say, some very practical advice. In some ways, it was kind of uh, a little bit cowardly if you wanted to look at it in that way. So he's a bit of a politician, not really taking a, a firm, uh, controversial stand by any means, but kind of going in the middle route here. But this is what happens back in Acts 5, 33 through 39. I just want to read what Gamaliel said, reminding us that uh, Paul was his student. Acts 5, 33 through 39. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel a teacher of the law respected by all the people stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else, or else you may even be found to be fighting against God. So I just read that just to remind us that this is Paul's teacher. He's a Pharisee. He apparently is a member of the Sanhedrin. And he seems to be a fairly wise and a fairly level-headed man. I think that would be a fair way of describing him. And as Paul addresses the mob, he appeals to Gamaliel. You know, 
Gamaliel, the guy that you all know and respect. So I've been educated under Gamaliel. Uh, he appeals to the law. Uh, he also mentions his own zeal, so being zealous for God, just as you all are today. And so he's not insulting them, but he is identifying with the crowd. We think of Paul speaking on the Areopagus. Um, I see that you are very religious. I see this uh, idol dedicated to an unknown God. So it's kind of in that vein. It's kind of a, a being complimentary. They're wrong. Paul disagrees with them, but he's pointing this out in a very diplomatic way. So we have a, contra a common interest here. Uh, I am zealous toward God just like you are. In verse 4, Paul goes on to explain how he persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. And so he wasn't just zealous in theory. This wasn't some, you know, flaming paper he wrote. Uh, but he was zealous in what he actually did. And most of these people, I think, would know this about Paul. He had a reputation. He was well known for this. I should also point out that the way was a common description of the Lord's church, the Lord's people. Uh, years ago, I uh, preached on the name of the church. What do we call ourselves? Sometimes people wonder, what do we call ourselves as a group? And I think I concluded at that time that the church is technically nameless. I think I've titled that lesson, The Nameless Church. The, the Lord's Church does not have a proper name, uh, but it does have a number of descriptions. So, uh, the Kingdom of God. Notice that's not a capital K kingdom kind of name, Kingdom of God Incorporated kind of thing, as we would say today. Uh, the Family of God, the Household of God, the Church of the Firstborn, and on and on. There are a number of descriptions. Uh, multiple congregations are referred to once as the churches of Christ. In Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ greet you. I think that verse says in most translations. Um, as far as I can tell, the singular phrase, church of Christ, is not found anywhere in the Bible. And so I just say that to remind us that the church does not have a proper name, but we do have multiple descriptions of the church. So when we refer to the Church of Christ, then. We're not using a proper name, but we're describing a church or a congregation as belonging to Jesus. So in English, we would say Christ's Church. Christ apostrophe S, Church. That's hard for me to say and to be clear and to communicate that Christ's Church, but I think it's easier for me to say Church of Christ, the Church belonging to Christ. We're not using a proper name. We are describing it. It is a church belonging to the Lord Jesus. Um, and so I guess I would just take this as a, as a reminder that in a conversation, uh, it is not accurate for us to say, I'm Church of Christ. Okay, when people are talking about, what are you religiously? Well, I'm this, I'm that. And I should not be saying, well, I'm Church of Christ. Uh, because biblically, that really uh, does not make much sense. That's treating that descriptive phrase like the name of a denominational body, which the Lord's Church is not. We are simply uh, Christians, a part of the Lord's uh, congregation. So Paul describes himself as having persecuted this way to the death. And I just point out that is one description of the Lord's Church, the way. I think of Jesus saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. So his people following him as the way, as a group, they become known as the way. So no one comes to the Father but through me. We are on the, the straight and narrow way, so to speak. But anyway, this is where we get back to um, Paul talking about taking prisoners there to be persecuted or to be punished. So he's bringing these um, men and women back to uh, Jerusalem to be punished. And I would just take this as another reminder here that uh, they are not coming back to Jerusalem to face a trial, are they? Uh, they are not there to uh, have charges brought up against them, uh, but they are coming there to be punished. And so that's something that's kind of interesting for me to uh, note from this passage. So this is where Paul starts uh, telling his story. And I think he's making this point. I have been where you are now. I have been zealous for the law. Uh, even to the point of persecuting this way, even to the point of binding and putting both men and women into prisons. And he points out here uh, that the priests, the high priests, the council of the elders, all of these men, they can verify this. They'll, they'll, testi they'll testify to my zeal. In fact, they were in on it. We worked together on this. They gave me letters. I went out and did their dirty work. So they made the decisions. I made it happen. 
And it's at this point that Paul mentions Damascus. Uh, we, of course, having studied Acts 9, we know where Paul is going with this. He had letters from the Jewish authorities uh, sending him on a mission to bring people back even from Damascus. And so he's on this journey to Damascus. So let's continue tonight then with Acts 22, verses 6 through 11. Acts 22, 6 through 11. But it happened that as I was on my way, approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. And those who are with me saw the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Up in verse 6, he talks about approaching Damascus around noon when he's surrounded by this bright light from heaven. Uh, just a note here, if, if a light is described as being bright at noon up in the area of Syria. This is kind of a, a desert area, at least a lot of it is today. I mean, that is a really bright light. So brighter than the sun itself, we might say. Uh, he falls to the ground. He hears this voice. We learned about this previously from that first account back in Acts 9. And he's going to tell the story again later in the book of Acts. But once again, he hears this voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, as we noted a few months ago, to persecute the Lord's people is to persecute the Lord himself, isn't it? So when we persecute his people, we're persecuting him. And the Lord takes that personally. He is the head of his body, the church. So Saul wants to know who it is who's speaking. And this voice identifies himself as Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. Uh, some of you might be aware that Jesus being identified as a Nazarene has been pretty relevant uh, just over the past several years in the world around us. Back around 2014, as the Islamic State in Iraq really started uh, gaining ground and turning up the heat over in Iraq, um, part of their reign of terror and uh, persecuting Christians, part of their reign of terror was to spray paint the Islamic letter N on the homes of those who were suspected of following Jesus. And they used it as an insult. So they didn't call him Jesus, but they kind of reduced Jesus to some guy from Nazareth, so the Nazarene, in the, the letter in there. So those who lived in those homes that were marked, they were then given the choice of renouncing Jesus and converting to Islam. They could pay a huge tax, which was absolutely out of the realm of possibility for most people. They could be executed or they could leave. They could just run. And that's what happened back then in Iraq. Outside Iraq, though, some then took up the Arabic letter in as something of a badge of honor. It was a sign of protest. So you might have seen this as people's Facebook profile for a pic, for a while. Um, some people even got this symbol tattooed on their bodies as a sign of uh, solidarity with those who were being persecuted for the Christian faith. But that goes back to uh, the persecution by ISIS in Iraq. So if you've seen that symbol, and to me it looks like a U with a dot over it, but that's the letter N apparently in Arabic. And uh, this is how Jesus identifies himself to Saul. And so, indeed, we worship Jesus the Nazarene. And so we would certainly identify with that, with that symbol. And I wouldn't take that as an insult at all, even though that's the way it's intended. Um, in verse 10, Paul tells the crowd that he responds to the Lord. He responded asking what he needs to do. Um, I kind of find it interesting that a lot of people today would say, do, what do you mean? You don't have to do anything. Just believe kind of thing. But uh, that's not what happens here. Um, but anyway, he asked what he needs to do, and to me, he's inviting the mob into his mind here. Kind of pretend you're me for a little bit. Basically, if you hear the voice of the Lord in a blinding light, wouldn't you do what I did? Wouldn't you ask what you need to do next? Wouldn't you also go in this direction? So he's kind of inviting them in on his, on his mind frame here. And the Lord's response is that Saul is to continue into Damascus and to wait to be told what to do. And again, as we've noted a number of times previously, God normally doesn't tell people what to do to, uh, directly. He doesn't say, hey, you need to be baptized or whatever, straight to somebody's face. But he arranges for a messenger to step in. Uh, we think of Philip 
being told to go meet with the man from Ethiopia. God didn't tell the Ethiopian man what to do personally, but he arranged the meeting and so on. Uh, preaching the gospel is a responsibility that God has designated to us. I don't mean just to me as a preacher, but to all of us, to us as disciples. Uh, that's our job. Uh, Paul explains he's blind at this point. So those who were with him had to lead him by the hand into Damascus. And again, as we noted back in Acts 9, how embarrassing this must have been. Uh, Paul is leading this team. They're on this bold mission. Uh, but for some weird reason, there's this light. Paul goes blind. And now, you know, he's talking to the sky, probably from their point of view. And now he has to be led by the hand, uh, by his own subordinates. So that uh, certainly must have been very humiliating. Uh, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph for us, at least today. And this is Acts 22, verses 12 through 16. Acts 22, verses 12 through 16. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. In verse 12, we learn about Ananias again. Only here it seems like Paul is once again identifying with the temple mob. Ananias is just like you. Notice how he describes this man. He is devout by the standard of the law. He is well spoken of by the Jews. You can go ask those people up in Damascus. Even today, you can go ask them. I think is what Paul is inviting them to do. You know, all of us in this scenario, we all come from a very strict Jewish background. I'm not an outsider coming in here wreaking havoc, but I am just like you are. I am zealous for the law. As we noted back in Acts 9, Ananias is never described as being a preacher. In Acts 9, he's simply described as a certain disciple. And I mentioned this before, but several years ago, I referred to him as a preacher. For some reason in a sermon, I said, the, you know, God got the preacher Ananias to go talk to Paul. Uh, but somebody pulled me aside and corrected me on that. And it wasn't a, a serious thing. You're teaching false doctrine kind of thing. But uh, it was an interesting point. And, and the point is, when God needed somebody to go teach Saul, this violent persecutor of the church, he didn't go get Peter or John to do it. He didn't get an apostle, but he got Ananias some guy to do it. So any disciple can teach anybody else the gospel. That That is the responsibility uh, for all of us. So uh, Paul's vision is restored and Ananias has this message for Saul uh, that he has appointed him to know his will and to see the righteous one. So that's a reference to Jesus, to hear an utterance from his mouth. So beyond that meeting on the road where he was told to go into Damascus and wait to uh, hear the next steps, beyond that, you know, after Saul obeys the gospel, there is more to come. And so uh, Paul will hear from Jesus himself more in the future. Paul will get the message, not secondhand, but as an apostle, uh, Jesus will go on to speak to him directly. And, and Paul will then be a witness, an eyewitness of everything that he's seen and heard. Uh, as to the gospel itself, as to what Saul needs to do next, uh, now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So this is more information than we had back in Acts 9. Back in Acts 9, Luke puts it this way. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. So that's a parallel passage. This is Paul retelling it again in his own words. So let's just notice uh, some new information here in Acts 22, verse 16, that we didn't get the full picture of back in Acts 9. Uh, first of all, there is clearly an urgency to what Paul's being told to do here, isn't there? Now, why do you delay? And, and the answer is, there is no reason to delay. It's kind of a hypothetical uh, question there, isn't it? So, uh, you know, it's, uh, why do you delay? There is no uh, reason to delay. So you need to do this as soon as uh, humanly possible. This is an urgent thing that I'm telling you to do here. Um, the reason for the urgency 
is explained a little later in this verse, as Ananias tells Saul that he is to be baptized to wash away his sins. And so if I have sins that need to be washed away, if I have not yet been buried with Christ in baptism, if I am guilty in the eyes of God, um, baptism washes away those sins. Uh, therefore, baptism is something that needs to be done sooner rather than later, right? Without delay, immediately. And this certainly fits in with what we know about baptism from other passages. Another brief observation of this verse is that baptism requires getting up. Get up, as Ananias says. So instead of Ananias bringing a cup of water to Saul and sprinkling him on the head, that won't do it here, will it? That will not accomplish this command. So Saul has to get up to go to the water somewhere. And this may be rather minor, uh, but I mention this because it fits in with what we know about the act of baptism in other passages. Beyond the word itself, meaning to dip or to plunge or to sink underwater, um, just the wording surrounding uh, these words here gives us a clue that baptism is something you need to get up to do. So get up and be baptized. Um, I'd also point out that Saul is to be baptized. Um, and you look at the wording of that. Saul is to be somewhat passive in this scenario. At least that's the way I think I would word this. Baptism is not some heroic act that we accomplish. It's nothing we can brag about. But baptism is something that we allow to happen to us. It is done to us with our permission, we might say. So he's not told, you know, go baptize yourself, but he is told to be baptized. And again, this may be a rather minor observation, but it does fit in with what we know from other passages, that we don't save ourselves. Uh, we aren't saving ourselves when we're baptized. But the act of baptism is the point where we actually put our faith in the power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So in that sense, we are being saved at the point of baptism, but it's God who's actually doing the work and the action in that process. And the other observation I would make here is that baptism is pictured as calling on his name. So in baptism, we call on the name of the Lord. And I know some people see that phrase, calling on the name of the Lord, and they assume that there is something that we say, uh, dear Lord, save me, or something like that. Uh, the sinner's prayer uh, which, by the way, is found nowhere in the Bible. It is not there. And so that is not what we see in Scripture. There's no prayer that saves us. But instead, in 1 Peter 3.21, Peter describes baptism as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And so that's this calling on the name of the Lord. Baptism is the act of appealing to God. Again, Peter says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism saves us because it's that point or at that point through the act of baptism that we make that appeal to God for a good conscience by being obedient to the gospel message. And for all of these reasons, Ananias encourages Saul. He really commands him, if you look at it, he commands him to be baptized immediately. And this seems to be a good place for us to pause for tonight. Uh, tonight, though, we've studied uproar in Jerusalem. We've worked our way into chapter 22, valuable citizenship. We've just kind of barely touched on the fact that he's a citizen of this city. Doesn't really nail it down that he's a Roman citizen at this point. So we haven't seen his citizenship be too important yet. It might have allowed him to, to approach the crowd. That could be valuable citizenship, maybe twice in this chapter. Uh, but hopefully we'll get to the main uh, passage on that next week. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study with us uh, tonight. I hope all of you can be present for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And please plan on joining us in between uh, those two services for the Bible class, uh, Bible study at 10. And let me know between now and then, if you can, if you have something that we need to be praying about. I know a lot's going on. Uh, things are happening in our lives. We have some things to be happy about. We have some things we can be sad about. Uh, we've got some challenges. We've got some health things going on, emotional, mental concerns. And if there's some way we can help you by praying for you, uh, we would love to hear from you. And I uh, hope you'll give me a call or send an email uh, sometime this week. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. And we praise you tonight for being our God. Thank you for being merciful to us. Thank you for giving us your book. And thank you for telling us about your servant, Paul, 
We are thankful for his courage in preaching, even in the midst of a riot. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for saving us from sin. In Jesus we pray. Amen.